Hi, I'm Riley Moynes, author of The Four Phases of Retirement and its sequel, The Ten Lessons. We're speaking with people who are squeezing all the juice out of their retirement. People with widely divergent backgrounds, experience, and expertise. People with stories that can inspire and encourage you, too, to squeeze all the juice out of your retirement. Thanks for joining us for today's conversation. Here we go. My guest today is Jonathan Chevro, a veteran columnist, blogger, and author based in Toronto. Many of our listeners will know him as the Financial Post's personal finance columnist from 1993 to 2012 and editor-in-chief of Money Sense magazine from 2012 to 2014. He's also author of several financial and retirement-focused books, has a large Twitter following at at John Chevro, and is rated one of the top two social media influencers in finance in Canada. John, welcome. Thank you for joining me today. Glad to be here, Riley. Uh, John, you declared your Financial Independence Day in May of 2014. No, most people don't use that term, but why did you use it and what, what, what does it mean to you? Uh, Independence Day, uh, well, that's obviously a, a neologism, as they call it. So it's just simply a contraction of Financial Independence Day. That title came from a book that I wrote in 2008. Um, Whenever it was, uh, it, I, I had a, a client that wanted to have a book written and uh, about financial independence, and I was just noodling around this uh, idea of the American Independence Day, fin- Financial Independence Day, yeah. fin- Independence Day. So it seemed like an, I was surprised nobody, nobody had even cared enough to register the URL, so I got FinIndependenceDay.com, which later led to FinIndependenceHub.com, which we can talk about later. Uh-huh. And so that's your version of, 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 your, of your retirement day. And since declaring your Independence Day, you've continued your writing activities. And although you're not working full-time, you do continue to contribute to the Financial Post and the Globe and Mail and moneysense.ca. Tell us about that involvement at this time. Well, basically, my two biggest clients are former employers, so I guess that you know, speaks well of the employers. Um, you know, the post in particular was 19 years. Mm-hmm. Uh, even after I left Money Sense full time, I was still their editor at large for a while. Right. And, uh, and I still write for them about once a month, something called the Retired Money Column. I think I may have reviewed your book there. I think you did. Yes, at, thank at you. some point. And um, so that's your typical freelance sort of thing. I mean, they don't pay a, you know, a huge amount, these people, but, you know, once a month, every two months or so. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm at the point where I sort of, uh, I don't really, uh, I call it jiggling up. I don't jiggle up editors. I'm happy not to do anything. <laughs> uh, but if something comes interesting comes along, I'm happy to do it as well. Uh, you know, my wife just said, to, like, so I'm, you know, I'll be 67 probably by the time this airs. And uh, my wife is just a year or two younger. And she sort of entered into parallel sort of. So if you're up here in the house, we have, uh, you know, basically two home offices now. Right. Uh, so that I could talk, we could talk about that at some point. <laughs> sure. Well, let's talk a little bit about that right now. <laughs> you, there are some challenges when you're both retired. Well, you see a lot of each other, um, but you know, fortunately, we've been married, uh, getting on for 31 years, and we get along fine. Thank you for asking. Um, I, I here in Long Branch, uh, you know, it's just a lovely area of town. We're like we're like three blocks, three houses up from the lake. Right. I spend a lot of time. You know, we we we're sort of health and fitness. We could talk about as well. Um, I'll probably spend two hours a day just listening to podcasts like this and other financial podcasts and Mm -hmm. news podcasts, just strolling west and east along Lake Ontario. Uh, You know, I try to get the 10,000 steps Mm -hmm. thing. So, for example, uh, about two years ago, uh, I co-founded a a Facebook group called Younger Next Year 2020. Mm -hmm. It was originally 2019, but they just renamed it as the years go by. Right. And uh, what was interesting was that my co-founder of this group, and there's more than a thousand people on it now, uh, is a financial planner from Rochester Mm -hmm. who I met strictly through the internet. And she did come to my 65th birthday party uh, a year ago, April. And uh, so, but because we both have those set of contacts, we ended up getting a critical mass of both Canadian and American participants. So, mm-hmm. and so, it, as you know, you know, once you hit a certain age and you're you're, you're working because you want to, not because you have to, yeah. uh, it's all about health and social interaction. Uh, we've seen what's happening with this global virus. 
um, that health is something that, well, you can even see the interaction between health and wealth, but that's a whole topic for another day, I would mm. think. Can't take either of them for granted. You certainly can't. What, what's different about your, your typical day now that you have declared your financial independence? Well, it's interesting. Even as a salary employee, I used to write about something. There was a book written in the 50s called How to Work Four Hours a Day Without Feeling Guilty About It. <laughs> That's the key part of it, without feeling guilty <laughs> about it. So I would, you know, employers still expect you to have your bum in the seat for eight hours. So I would talk about how most creative artists, musicians, even executives, um, really have four or five hours of what I would call really creative time. If you're going to be right, doing a painting or writing an art symphony, or, even, or writing, uh, there's about four or five hours of real time. So most office workers, I would suggest, if they get a two-hour stint in the morning and a two-hour stint in the afternoon, then this author, actually, Reich, I think his name was, uh, recommended taking the two hours off for lunch, you know, either for exercise or networking, having lunch with contacts, building your resource base, even taking courses if there's a university place nearby. Mm -hmm. So for me, uh, I was even doing that on company time, the four hour day. Yes. But, but you, know, you, you, so the like most office workers, the first half hour, they're not doing much, right? They're like checking emails, Facebook, whatever, reading the paper, mm -hmm. uh, unless they have to hit the, get the ground running. Uh, so I, I'm, I was very careful to, uh, for me, a big transition was was getting off that, that I, I don't have to work four hours a day now. I can work three hours. Mm -hmm. And it sort of just become a little, you, when you're no longer all about invoicing to keep the wolf from the door because you've got investment income and pensions and everything else, all the good things that the government, Canadian government makes possible after age 65, right. um, you can work as little or uh, hard as you want to. Mm -hmm. My wife is consulting now and doing training. And last night was unusual. She worked till nine. And I'm going, that's not, you didn't work till nine when you're retired. And it's like, well, she's got a big project. She's giving it a little talk as she speak, as we speak. Um, so, uh, as you say, uh, for me, leaving corporate employment and becoming self-employed or an entrepreneur was a natural transition. I was already going down the path of financial punditry, if you will, right. um, but more on my terms. Sure. Yeah. Now, the, you, you're focusing today on, on, on your own website, Financial Independence Hub, or thindependencehub.com. Tell us more about that. Well, that was after I left Money Sense. Um, I had a, a site to promote the book, Independence Day, which is available in the U.S. edition and Canadian edition. You can still buy it by going to FindependenceDay.com. Um, but that was only uh, maybe uh, once a week. And actually, part of my Money Sense contract when I went, became editor at large was I would write two blogs, one of which w they would rerun uh, on, on, at Money Sense. Mm -hmm. Um, but at, at some point I decided it would be better to have daily content rather than weekly. As a newspaper reporter, I was always, uh, my slogan was, an editor, sorry, a story a day keeps the editor away. <laughs> In other words, I'd rather be a self-starter. I don't want somebody to tell me what to do. If I keep on throwing them ideas and they just keep on accepting them, then I have more control over my destiny. <laughs> so that was, the, I, I decided the Independence Hub was going to have daily content. Now, I maybe you could write every day, Riley, but uh, I'm not that productive. No, no. So I, a big model was to get a lot of guest blogs. So it's published about 1,700 blogs now. Yeah, wow. It's been going f more than five years. I have major sponsors like you know Vanguard, Franklin Templeton, for example, two, two you'd know, mm -hmm. and uh, other people. And, uh, and it's been fun. So probably 90% probably of the content is, is uh, other financial people, other financial bloggers where we sort of have an alliance together, people like... Uh, Dale Roberts at Cut the Crap Investing, Rob Engine, a boomer and echo, been there for a while. We just run each other's content whenever it strikes us to do to do so. Mm -hmm. um, it's you know it doesn't pay like a, a real job, mm -hmm. uh, but on top of writing and collecting your your, your rents and your 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 investment income and your pensions, uh, it's not a bad life. Sure, sure. Now, John, uh, many of the people that I've interviewed um, make a, a kind of a 90-degree turn when they retire from things that they were doing during their career to something really quite different. Your situation is more, it sounds like, kind of a continuation of something that you have done well and you've done for a long time and that you obviously enjoy. Would that be a fair way to describe kind of your trajectory at this point? 
Yeah, that's fair. I mean, it's still financial writing. It's just, you know, again, I'm more, it's just really the transition from employment to self-employment. Sure. But as I said, when I was talking about, you know, the four-hour day and keeping the editors away, even as a, one, one editor <laughs> once called me a bit of a renegade at the Globe, actually, even when it was the Globe for a while, because I was basically like, I, I was sort of an entrepreneur, I guess they call it entrepreneurs, you know, where you're inside the corporation, yeah, but you yeah. try to carve out your own little niche. Mm-hmm. But it's a lot easier to be that kind of person Person when you're when you're um, semi-retired or you're mm-hmm. independent. Mm-hmm. Indeed. Now, this is an activity that you've been involved with for a long time, uh, writing about financial affairs and and developments and so on. Um, and obviously, uh, it does give you it gives you a sense of satisfaction. At least I assume it does. But what what really do you get out of the effort that you're putting into creating all of this information? What what's in it for you? Well, if nothing else, I know that I'm still reaching people. Like I have more than a, th- a thousand subscribers to the Hub at this point, in addition to the the thousand plus at uh, uh, Younger Next Year. Sure. So whether I'm pontificating about health and wellness or about financials, and actually not me pontificating, my guest bloggers, and we have to be more accurate about it. Uh, either way, I'm making an impact on. I mean, people are sure. absorbing the stuff, and we're exchanging information. You have discussions uh, either on Facebook or Twitter, yeah. or, or or comments right on the site. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's not like you're just going into a void. In, in a newspaper, you do get some kind of feedback, I suppose, letters to the editor and that thing. They're usually bad. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Whereas it's more of like, this is like supportive communities. In fact, I I once got, I had a, a dry run for the for independence when I did The Wealthy Boomer. Going back to the books, the, I wrote The Wealthy Boomer, which is actually Life After Mutual Funds, mm-hmm. 1998, which is after I wrote a series of mutual fund guides, which I think you were involved in as well, in your own separate line. Yep. Um, that was the era of Duff Young and, uh, and, how, and uh, who was it, Rangachand, all those people. <laughs> and Gordon Pape, of course. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, you don't see a lot of mutual fund guys out there anymore. No, that's for sure. um, but anyway, so for me, life after mutual funds, that's where the wealthy boomer came. It led to this discussion forum, which was quite vibrant for five years. And I'd always thought, even while I was a salary employee at the Post, that it would be a nice retirement project. Well, for one reason or another, which actually the gory details are in the book, (laughs) which is a financial novel, Independence Day, about what happened to the wealthy boomer forums. Um, But anyway, so when I did finally leave Money Sense and no longer was an employee, I sort of wanted, that was why I did Independence Day, or Independence Hub, I wanted something that was almost full-time, would make a little money, and allow me to, uh, again, to have that semi-retirement project. The the theme of our podcast series is uh, squeezing all the juice out of retirement, and so I want to ask you what 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 does that mean for you when you when you hear that phrase? Well, I think it means uh, max. I mean, what is juice? I, I would think it's like family and friends most of all, and um, and. Uh, uh, hobbies, and you know, well, you, you certainly have the opportunity to read as many books as you mm-hmm. want. Actually, again, I almost will read a lot of books or read, listen to audio books when I'm listening to podcasts right. on those ubiquitous walks. Mm-hmm. Um, like a lot of retirees, why we we we'll watch a little TV at night. We'll watch a, a show and a, and, a, and a comedy or something. Like after nine o'clock, I'm sick of processing information. Mm-hmm. For me, I'm. If anything, I'm an occupational hazard of this business is is um, overload on the media. So I have normally I would have probably CNN or BN, BBC on right now, mm-hmm. um, and I subscribe to about a half dozen newspapers like New York Times and the Washington Post and the Globe right. and the Post, both of them, mm-hmm. and a few others, Economist, and uh, to properly absorb all that information, it's like hours a day. <laughs> yeah, that's right. And then you, then the temptation is to apply the knowledge in your own investing, because of course I'm a do-it-yourself investor at, uh, at, at, with a discount brokerage, mm-hmm. and then that feeds back into the, the Facebooks and the Twitters and, and, the, and the Hubs uh, posts. Um, so I think we squeeze a lot of Jews out of the... Uh, the financial stuff, but uh, but you can't confuse means without end. I mean, why did why did we spend all those years talking about money, you and I, Riley, 
for the benefit of others. It was the whole idea was, uh, so now you can do something else. I think I thought that I was going to be, you know, a great financial a novelist. I mean, not a financial, just a novelist, you know, be the next Tolstoy. I mean, I, <laughs> oh, every second journalist I've ever known is a closet novelist. So Independence Day was my attempt at that. It was sort of a financial novel, not what you would call a real novel. But right. it, it did incorporate lots of things like plot and setting and characterization yeah. and all that stuff. But at this point, I don't really, I've sort of changed that I mean, if now for me, squeezing the juice out of retirement would probably be more along the lines of a of a spiritual um, reading a lot of spiritual things uh, and books. I mean, I still go to a church and you know minor involvement and in, you know, being a sidesman that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I don't feel that I've gotten all the juice out of it, but I try to get a few hours of yeah. juice out of it every You're day. Working at it. You're working yeah. at it. Yeah. So uh, people who come along and say or ask for your advice as to how they can squeeze all the juice out of retirement, what what sort of things would you be encouraging them to do? Some of the things you're doing, and maybe some others, or. Well, yeah, you could uh, you know read your book about the uh, the four phases of retirement, and <laughs> that would be a good idea. And your subtitle <laughs> is, is is squeezing the juice out in the, the workbook. I think that came out. Yeah, you could read Independence Day. Go to the Hub. You could go to Victory Lap Retirement, which is the book I wrote with Mike Drack, an ex corporate banker, and you can go to VictoryLapRetirement.ca for Mike's blogs. Um, these are all good things. I mean, I you know you have to subscribe to a couple of good financial newspapers. Uh, even if you do have, uh, you know, a good financial advisor, uh-huh. or if you're doing it yourself, uh, you've all the more you're going to have to really know what's going on. I, I, I suppose you don't need. You could just go with the, a Vanguard balanced ETF and, and and be done with it. You don't really have to do anything with this stuff. <laughs> That's true. But I, I think for people like you and I, we kind of get caught up in the the fun of it all. Really, sure. if, when sure. push comes to shove, I have to admit what uh, what aspects of this phase of your life are are you finding most gratifying, most enjoyable? Well, you still need structure and routine, and so I find again I describe the four hour day. So let's say I'm down to a two or three hour day now in my old age here. So what do you do with that extra hour or two? You probably spend an extra half hour reading the paper a little bit more leisurely. Mm-hmm. Not, sometimes it's like, i got to get it all read up by 9.30 or 9.45 yeah. so I can actually do something for the two hours between 10 and 12. Of course, then I have to have lunch, right? So you have these deadlines. So I said, well, what if I only do an hour and a half this morning? Uh, and, and then and then you have very pleasant things like what we're doing today, which happens to be a Friday afternoon, mm-hmm. um, which is... That's sucking the juice, I think, and it's kind of fun, mm-hmm. more fun than, uh, you know, sitting all by yourself, uh, being in self-isolation, yeah. uh, you know, pounding out words from some editor. <laughs> and, and, and what, on the, on the flip side, what, what parts of this phase of your life are you finding most challenging? Um, well, <laughs> apart from the financial side, because when we were speaking, markets were, were in a bit of a downdraft, uh, I do find that stressful. I mean, when, when, when the stocks, stock market goes down, and I mean, you and I could spend a whole time talking about um, risk management and what you can do. Uh, you know, obviously, people at, at retirement age should be uh, close to 50% fixed income, I'd say. If you're a little aggressive, it could be uh, 40%. Um, so that's a challenge, the financial part of it. I mean, mm-hmm. I don't have a huge defined benefit inflation index pension plan, mm-hmm. uh, and my wife has none at all. So um, apart from the little pensions most of us get, uh, we have you know, decent nest eggs practicing what we preach all these years. Sure. Um, but you have to manage that right. well. Yeah. And if you don't, um, you know, what happened in March 2020 is a good object lesson of what happened. If, if people were 100% in stocks and... They're in their 60s or 70s. I would think they'd be experiencing a little more stress mm-hmm. than they would really should be experiencing at this stage of life. Yeah. Right. It's time to smell the roses, not to worry about whether the roses are all going to get butchered and died. <laughs> now, uh, Jonathan, you're not the sort of person I can, I can imagine who's sitting around letting the grass grow. So tell me about some of your, your plans uh, for the future. What, what, what are you cooking up next? Well, travel is always a big thing, and, and not really for me, but my wife. And so, you know, happy wife, happy life. So, if, if right now we have a trip planned, you know, cross, uh, what, uh, touch wood, uh, from from Morocco in the spring. Mm-hmm. Uh, we just came back from a couple of weeks in South Africa. Before that, last summer was Barcelona. 
Um, Fortunately, my wife works in the transportation industry and, and often goes to two or three conferences a year where at least her portion of the airfare and hotel is paid for. So sure. so we've been to all sorts of places like Istanbul and uh, um, Kuala Lumpur, which mm -hmm. I never even really knew what Kuala Lumpur was. It was quite a modern city. Mm -hmm. And more, you know, Dublin, for example, everywhere. Sure. Uh, I, per, if it's just me all alone, I don't think I'd travel that much. I personally think travel is overrated and expensive. Um, but uh, it also broadens your horizons. And uh, all I can say, Riley, I've been doing this for five years working from home, and I, I've never bored. I've never right. been bored. Yeah. Uh, so people who say that retirement is boring, I'm not sure if you've run across people who think that. Not most of the folks that I chat to, no. know they're, uh, they're not bored. Yeah, so I, I certainly don't. And I don't see why that would change. We go to the gym, we do yoga. Sure. You, you, I do yoga two, three times a week. Nice. And uh, not because I love it, but it's part of a routine. It's important to stru have structured activities that get you out of the yes. house yes. Uh, when, you're, when you're working from home and you're semi-retired. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's just a nice combination. Some, the, good thing about, the good thing about the gym uh, is that you can go whenever you want. If you go, oh, I, I finished off by three, I can go sure. go work out for an hour. Yeah. Whereas the problem with yoga and some other more structured things, they, it's automatically scheduled. You can only go to that session at 12 on right. Monday, etc. Yeah. So the, between the two, it's a nice combination. You have a little structure you can put into your calendar, Monday, Wednesday, 12 o'clock, going to go to yoga. Uh, and then if you got some time, yes, I'll go to the gym or just go for these long walks that I've told you sure. more than once. Uh, I enjoy doing. Are you still playing hockey? I am. Uh, yeah, we the West Mall old timers. We're we're in the playoffs now, and we're hoping <laughs> to be the top two. I was actually I near the top of the league a couple of years ago, but my shoulder has gotten degraded so much, osteoarthritis and other things you don't want to hear about, uh, that I've slipped in the, the, the personal scoring stand. <laughs> but, no, hockey is great. I mean, that, that's... It was, so my wife does things. She's got a book club, and they're, it's all girls. No guys allowed. Yeah. And then, so on hockey is, by definition, you know, only guys. Sure. So, you know, you have the camaraderie of the... Well, you know this. Your, your, yeah. your son, Chris, wrote a book yeah. about, what was it called, After the Game? Yeah, After the Game. After the Game, and, and, and how the professional athletes, when they retired, which is... 20 years earlier than mm -hmm. office workers, sure. uh, the thing, the single thing that they missed the most was the camaraderie. Yeah. So there's no reason why they can't join an old timers league. We would be delighted to have any old timer, any ex NHL player. Now that they're taking the rest of the season <laughs> off, they got the season off. John, if you didn't know your specific date of birth, how old would you be? Well, the, the number that hits my mind is 26. <laughs> Well, it's a little, I, 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 maybe I've inverted it at 62. Um, I, I just remember being at journalism school, age 25, 26, and it was in, in Western University of Western Ontario. It was a good crowd of people, you know. You, you've, you've gotten the first degree out of the way, in my case, a science degree, mm -hmm. and uh, you're sort of, everybody wants to, you know, they all thought they wanted to go to a newspaper or, you know, the CBC or something like that. Mm -hmm. And I can't say that I've stayed in touch with that many of them. You sort of see their names popping up in bylines, et cetera, or on TV. Uh, but for some reason, I remember at that time thinking, you know, 25, 26, is it pretty good? To... But if you'd asked me this question when I was a kid, I, was, I would still have a distinct memory that age eight was perfect. That I, I, when I was eight, I thought the whole world revolved around eight-year-olds. It was all about being eight. Like, why would you want to be any other age? So <laughs> 26, 62, eight, I don't know. We all State have a different mind. number. Yeah. State of mind. State of mind. John, thank you very much for joining me today and for sharing your post-career activities with, uh, with our listeners. Now, folks, we're always interested in hearing from people who are squeezing the juice out of their retirement. And if that sounds like you, I'd love to hear from you. And perhaps we can share your story with our listeners as well. You can contact me by email, riley at squeezingthejuice.ca. I hope you've enjoyed today's conversation and that you'll join us again next time as we help you squeeze all the juice out of retirement. I'm Riley Moynes. Bye for now.